Okay. Thanks for coming. Um, this is a case study of how Princeton University upgraded from Drupal 7 to 9. You notice it does say 9. We were, we were at 8 for a little bit there, but um, we're on 9. I don't know which 9 we're on. 9.5. Thank you, Byron. 9.5. Um, so, uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me and then a little short brief history of Drupal at Princeton and then um, the project is, is the meat of my presentation and then we leave some time for questions. Um, but also I want to make a, a plug for the session right after me in this room uh, with Brian Osborne in the back. He's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention a, a platform, it's called our Site Builder version 2. He's going to go into detail about that platform. So if you want to hear about that, uh, stick around in this room right after my presentation. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been um, here at Princeton for 22 years. I have a graphic design and a communications background. Um, so started out with print design and then got into web design. Um, I have actually done CSS and HTML, but uh, today, I manage a group called Web Development Services here at Princeton. Uh, we're 15 people. We've got seven developers, uh, four um, people on our content strategy and design team, uh, two project managers, an accessibility specialist. You might have been in his session this morning, John Jameson with Editorially. I'll make a plug for Editorially. If you do websites and you need an accessibility checker for your content creators, or your editors, um, check out his tool. Um, and then uh, me, the director. Um, our place at Princeton is uh, in central IT, and that's a 300 plus person group. Um, so we are part of the larger organization of central IT. Um, and our, our mission with web development services is to provide um, self-service websites uh, in addition to professional website help. So you can come to my group and you can um, get a website, we give you like a shell, and then you can go ahead, you fill it in, and we offer support, and we offer training classes and documentation. Or if you need the hands-on help to, to build your site from start to finish, we, you can come to us too, we'll put together a project, and, and we do uh, website projects. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I, you know, this, this ha-ha over here on the side, I went to find one of my earliest um, tech projects here at Princeton, and it was in Flash, and uh, that's not on the web anymore. So, um, so Drupal here at Princeton um, started back in 2010. Uh, we had um, been running a content management system by the name of Roxin. No one, I expect, has heard of that, uh, except for maybe some FFW folks. Uh, it's R-O-X-E-N. I don't even know if it still exists anymore. But we decided it was just no longer a viable product that we wanted to continue with. So we looked at some other content management systems and uh, we chose Drupal. We liked how there was a community around it and you could extend it and we could um, make it what we wanted. So in 2011, we started experimenting. We, we built a site, we built another site. Uh, a whole bunch of us went to DrupalCon Chicago and um, we just we dove into the deep end learning Drupal 7. Uh, we built more websites, but we knew that we were um, working toward a multi-site because we knew that we were going to be running hundreds and hundreds of websites. We needed to do that efficiently with, with one team, uh, reliably, repetitively, um, and we needed a way to manage that. Um, so in uh, 2013, 2014, we partnered with FFW, at the time they were called Blink Reaction, and we built our first Drupal 7 multi-site platform. Um, and it, you know, it worked for us. We learned a lot with that platform. We built um, hundreds of sites on it, I don't know, something over 300 sites on it. And um, for the most part, it, it worked, but we did learn um, things that we needed more from that we couldn't quite do with that Drupal 7 multi-site. Uh, so at some point we said, okay, well we need to start looking toward the future and we started to look at Drupal 8 and we took a lot of what we learned from Drupal 7 and we aimed to put it in Drupal 8 and try not to repeat the mistakes of our past. Um, so in 2018 we started to build 
quadruple eight multi-sites. And in 2019, we started to talk about planning our upgrade of Drupal 7. Uh, and then this fall, or yeah, this summer actually, summer, fall, late summer, uh, we expect to shut down Drupal 7 uh, completely. There are other um, pockets and departments and units around Princeton that are probably still running Drupal 7, but they, the bulk in central IT, uh, we expect to be off Drupal 7, so we're getting there. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about our project. Uh, and, and please you, uh, ask any questions, raise your hand during the presentation and glad to answer them. So I'm gonna start to talk about like two major areas. So one is just ramping it up, getting it going, starting it, getting it off the ground. And then the second is um, going through the project. So there's a couple areas of our project uh, I was gonna cover. So we have the leadership buy-in. How do we get Princeton to get on board with this project and fund it? Uh, what was the scope? Um, what, what were our costs? I'm, don't worry, I'm not gonna like, give dollar numbers right now. Um, <laughs> but just how do we like figure out like how much is this thing gonna cost? Uh, finding a partner to do it with, like who, who can help us do this? And then are, are we even like ready to do this? So leadership buy-in, um, it, we have a process here, there's a, there's a funding process. I'm not gonna go into it it's specific to Princeton, but, but essentially what we said to leadership was, you know, we've just invested in, in getting um, to Drupal 7. We shut down Roxon, we've been on Drupal 7, it's running well, we've invested in Drupal 7, so we need to maintain that investment. And part of that um, maintenance, uh, maintaining the investment is um, planning for the future, which was Drupal 8. Plus we wanna keep things secure and supported. Um, we knew websites continue to be very important communication tools. I don't see them going away anytime soon here. People are still um, looking at websites and um, prospective students look at them when they're trying to figure out, do I want to go to Princeton? Um, faculty look at it if, if they want to become part of the faculty here. Um, what, what events are going on at Princeton? How do I apply for this? What summer program? What sports things are running? It's on and on and on. Websites communicate that. So, very important tools. Um, part of our, um, our, our pitch to leadership was that this Drupal 7 to 8, 9 upgrade was gonna be this one time heavy lift. Our hope and expectation is when we go from Drupal um, 9 to 10, it's, it's less disruptive than going from 7. And we've sort of kind of proved that now when we've gone from uh, 8 to 9, so mid project, uh, we went from eight to nine and, and nothing blew up and, and crashed. So we're hoping you know, nine to 10 and 10 to 11 should be good. Um, so you're gonna, so what we asked uh, our leadership here at Princeton was like, look, we, get, we need this one time funding for this one time heavy lift. From then on, and not into infinity because no tech lasts to infinity, it, it should be less disruptive. Uh, it's also, this Drupal 7 project for us was an opportunity to consolidate um, a little bit I'm going to describe, we have these bundles of sites, these types of sites. So we wanted to consolidate into one um, code base. Uh, it's also an opportunity to clean up. So I'm going to talk about dead websites. And it's also an opportunity to make accessibility improvements. We had already invested um, time and money into the accessibility of our Drupal 7 platform, but now we, we can take it even further with Drupal 8. So um, we, we got this, the initial, like, yes, go ahead, start, start to plan this. Um, but the scope of it, uh, was for, it was big. You know, it's, we had over 1,000 websites, but not really, because a lot of them were dead. Um, and so we started to look at, oh, just how many websites do we really have to upgrade? Um, we knew that we had, we had three main types of websites. I'll, I'll describe that in a minute. Um, and then we started to break them out into subtypes and complexity. We've got simple ones and we've got mm, somewhat simple and we've got really complicated ones. We knew that we did things early on that were gonna come back to bite us. And sure, no one writes something perfect from the start. You know, in 2011, no, we, we did not do things how we would have done them today. 
but we had to make those mistakes. I, I, I remind um, the team that we had to make those mistakes. Those were the sites we learned on. Those were the sites that taught us like what to do and what not to do. Um, and so it, it, it's an acceptable amount of, of technical debt, and that's the way I refer to it, because uh, we had to learn. So we also knew that um, we made custom themes here. If you have browsed Princeton's websites, um, they're, they're not all required to fit the Princeton brand. Uh, they don't even have to have orange and black on them. They can be um, pink or purple. Um, so we had a variety of themes. Um, so custom themes and also I'll just say custom surprises. Like, oh, we did that to that site? Why did we do that? And, you know, at the time it, it got, you know, it accomplished the site, but um, yeah, we wouldn't do that today. But we knew we had, that those were in scope. Things that we had done to make a website do something, we, we had to recreate that. Maybe not the exact way, but yeah. We also knew that um, we weren't going to customize, we were not going to customize every site's theme. Uh, this was a consolidation opportunity to eliminate a lot of the custom themes that we did and move everyone into what we call the tiger theme. So that is the Princeton branded theme. It's, it is the black and orange and those grays, um, but we made that theme with a ton of variation. So out of scope was recreating everybody's design theme exactly. It, this also um, allowed us to do our uh, accessibility enhancements. So we were getting rid of older themes and going to the more accessible theme. But the scope, it was a balancing act. It was sort of like, well, do we spend time recreating this thing we did or do we do it in some different way? So it, it's a balancing act and that balancing act continued through the whole project. We would look at a site, especially the old, old ones, and, and start to go through it and say, well, we're going we're gonna to do this, but we shouldn't do that, or we should, we should do it in a, in a whole new way. Uh, so it, it took us um, several months to just get our heads wrapped around the scope. Um, this, this is actually right from our project notes. Uh, I just copied and pasted and maybe cleaned up a grammar thing or two here. But you'll see that um, we, our approach was to base uh, everything on the assumption that everything was gonna move. So when we did our count, we were like, well, during the time we actually get started, these sites that are in maintenance mode might actually come out of maintenance mode and launch. You know, we, we couldn't stop all website building at Princeton. It had to continue while we were doing the upgrade. So we based our number that, well, we think that, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe half of the maintenance mode sites are viable. Yep. Ma question. Maintenance mode, you mean the site being developed? Not sites, yet yeah, so question is maintenance mode, meaning the sites are being developed. Yep, they, they have not launched, they're in, they're not, so good question because maintenance mode can mean it's, in, it's just being maintained, there's some sort of work going on. But the way we use maintenance mode is that the site is not launched yet. Um, we also were going to include all of our Drupal platforms. So if you remember a, a, a few minutes ago, I said we have these three types. Uh, so our three types are, are what we call the Princeton Site Builder version one. The second type is our custom sites. These are all the like I don't know, oldies but goodies or just unique ones. And then we had a, a bundle of um, Open Scholar sites. We had downloaded the Drupal distribution uh, called Open Scholar and uh, created sites. So kind of to give you a sense on this, so PSBV1 is Princeton Site Builder. There were, I don't know, 300, 400 sites there. Custom sites, maybe we had like 30, 5, 40, and then Open Scholar sites, um, we thought we probably had, I don't even know, like 700, 800, somewhere around there. Uh, another assumption up front is that we were going to try and do this in as compressed of a time frame as possible because we didn't want to fall behind with future Drupal upgrades. So we didn't want to do this at a leisurely pace. We, at pace, we, we did it, I, I think, in a, in a moderately aggressive pace. Um, we also knew going into the project that our ongoing work of our team had to continue. We couldn't stop all of our work. And, and focus on this upgrade um, because people are still making websites here. We have projects, they're 
redesigns. Um, we knew we had to continue with our routine work. Uh, we also made the assumption that the site owners will move to this tiger theme. So if you remember, like I said, we had custom themes. Um, we were going to consolidate in the tiger theme. There was a few exceptions that we had noted. So going into this project, we knew, well, um, the Office of Information Technology theme, the group we're part of, we we're going to keep our theme. Uh, Dean for Research, Office of the Dean of the College. We knew that we'd have to budget for some custom themes. <coughs> Um, and the, uh, the last assumption was uh, we knew we needed the site owners to test, but they probably won't. So that was another assumption. You know, we asked people, look over your site, and, and, and I think during the project a good amount of them did, but we know that some of them weren't, we just weren't going to get their attention. And so we needed to plan for testing as best as we could. Okay. Uh, another part of the scope is how many websites, right? So at some point I was counting over a thousand websites. Um, and we, at the time, did not have a quick or easy way to find out like how many, I'll call them viable sites, that we thought we had. Um, we sort of knew, we, we kind of knew, but in the end, I, what really surprised me is that 63% um, of the sites actually upgraded. Um, so I mentioned the maintenance mode websites. These were the ones that um, were being developed. Um, there was abandoned websites. So some people requested a site from us. We gave them their, their shell or their template. And they just never continued to fill it in. It just sat there in maintenance mode. And it never launched. And sometimes they didn't even log in. Um, and then there was websites for uh, people who had left the university. They never told us to shut it down. Um, and we, we didn't know. Uh, so this, this is a problem that uh, we learned from this project that going forward we hope to not have again. We, we've written a solution for this. It's a, it's a custom uh, application. Uh, we had had something, it's called the Sites Database. Uh, that could probably be another presentation there, but I'll, I'll just stop there. But we, we are trying to automate this now. We're very close to that. Okay, Another, so okay, so the scope. Um, so I'll just describe the three types of sites in a little bit more detail. So Site Builder version one, this was our original multi-site. Uh, it was built in partnership with FFW, um, served us well. Um, but we knew that it was inflexible when it came to us needing to add you know, just one or two custom content types to a website. We just couldn't do it. And so if if there was a project that required a custom content type, we would automatically put them in our custom category. When really, like 80, 90% of their needs were met with the site builder. Um, and custom themes in here were hard to do. So while m many people want to look like the Princeton brand, uh, there's a number of groups that they just they want their own unique flavor. And you might see that walking around campus if you see like the posters for different things. Um, groups, departments, units, activities, initiatives, they tend to develop their own visual identity and we needed to accommodate that on some of the sites. And it wasn't always the easiest thing to do in version one. Okay, the second type were the Open Scholar sites. Uh, I already mentioned this is a distribution of Drupal. It was, it was primarily where we built our faculty and lab websites. Uh, it was open source at the time. Um, but we didn't really see that it had enhancements. Um, we didn't have time to contribute back to it. And so when um, we planned version two of our site builder, we just planned to roll them in. And then there was the custom sites. So I already talked about them. Those were, I'll call them our learning sites. They were still very good, but yeah, some of the early ones. Special snowflakes. Yeah. Hey, we built a few of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so I'm, this, for leadership, you know, this sort of like diagram was like, yes, we're consolidating all into one platform. So there's efficiencies. So we're taking these three types and we're putting all into the site builder version two. And I already made a plug for if you stick around in this room right after, you're going to hear a lot more about this um, platform. Um, okay, how big of an effort? Uh, what's in scope? What's out of scope? Um, so I mentioned that we broke these uh, site builder sites into even further categories. 
Um, we, we did some like massive spreadsheets. We really got a little, little complex with our calculations. But it gave us, this exercise gave us a, like a sense of like how might this project go? What, where are we gonna run into issues? So some of the criteria we talked about when we started to really break them down even more were the amount of nodes, um, CSS injector. We used it a lot. A uh, number of lines of CSS injector. Um, that because that would indicate well, okay, this is the theme thing we've got to deal with. Um, number of panel panes. So we went from, uh, in some cases, panels to the to blocks, to the layout builder. Um, looking at the cost of the original website project. So when we built it, um, we are a chargeback service here at the university. So I, I, I would charge departments to do the work. So we would kind of look at like, well, how long did it take us to build the site in the first place? And then, of course, uh, the age of the site and whether it was simple or not. So over here, this is actually um, some, some of the thought that went into our point system. And then we started to add a points and, and try to bundle them from there. And like we assign hours to points and we, we, we tried to estimate it. Like how long would it take our team to do it? Uh, cost, so yeah, so just like I said, we, were we ballparked how long would it take us to do it. We knew we weren't gonna do all the work, but the discussion around that um, just helped us find and discover things that we might not have found until later on in the project. So I mentioned we had points, we had huge spreadsheets, um, we tried to calculate hours, um, and the planning did, did, I think, help us when we got to our RFP process because we had already looked at a ton of websites and clicked through a ton of pages and we found some surprises and some older things that we were like, oh, right, I forgot we did that. Oh, yeah, okay. Let's not forget about that thing. Um, and the result of it was that we were, I, I hope, I think, we were able to develop a clearer RFP than if we hadn't gone through this exercise. Just, you know, here are vendors, look at all these sites, have fun estimating. Um, and we were able to ask better questions when we get to the RFP process. This took, um, if we started in maybe the summer, uh, this probably took four or five months at least of us just talking about these sites internally. Uh, so then we worked to find a partner, right? So I said our usual work had to continue. And um, it, there were 16 of us. Um, we couldn't dedicate the whole team to getting this done because the whole team probably could have worked on it, but we had to continue our usual work. So we did go uh, and do an RFP process. We did vendor interviews. We, we chose FFW as our partner, um, and that partnership has been successful. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, I set the bar for success in that no one has complained to me, my boss, or the CIO, and, and that has been true. So. <laughs> been good. No complaint. I'm looking at some, <laughs> some Princeton people. No complaints. Uh, okay, so then moving on. You know, what, how, how do we know that we're ready to actually start this? Um, so we felt that the, the, our, our new multi-site, that's that site builder uh, platform, was mature enough. I'll do, I'm doing enough in air quotes because it's never going to be perfect. Uh, but it was mature enough that we felt ready that we could start moving Drupal 7 sites into it. Um, we did plan that during the project things were going to come up and we needed to add them into the site builder. And we, we continue to do, to do that today. So it is, it's, we think of it as a product. It's um, ever growing and changing as, as people's needs change. But it, it's growing uh, once we see that there's something in Drupal 7 that we're missing, we will, we'll put it in. We don't put in every odd, unique, one-off edge case into it because it is the platform that's supposed to be used by many and it's supposed to meet most needs. But the way it was built, I'll give a lot of kudos to, to Brian Osborne, um, it does allow us to do some unique things without completely having to build the site somewhere else. Uh, we knew we were ready when we assigned a project manager. Um, so in the first slide when I said, you know, what's the team size, we actually have three project managers. One, that one the, the third project manager is dedicated just to this project, and a developer is dedicated just to this project. 
uh, working within WDS. Uh, but plenty of other people from the team participate more on a regular basis. Um, so our design manager, um, the, the designers and themers as needed, the development manager and, and our architect participate. Okay, so here we go. We thought we were, we're, we're ready enough. Um, we, uh, I'm gonna just talk about like how we're getting it done. And so we, we kicked off, we had communication plans, um, project management is a huge part of this. We had fun uh, and we learned a lot of lessons. Okay, so if I just kind of outline some of this from start to finish. So I mentioned we started this, the pre-planning uh, around the summer of 2019. I can't believe that just <laughs> a long ago. This was our leadership buy-in, talking about our assumptions, scope, our own estimates, uh, RFP, the three phases. So each one of those types, we broke it out into a phase. Um, and then we plan to be done uh, the fall of 2023. So we will shut down the Drupal 7 uh, stack in September of 2023. We, we will be off it before then. So we, we have cleanup tasks to do. So doesn't, don't anybody in this room think they have till then, but we can get off sooner. <laughs> okay. okay, so kickoff. What did we, what did we, what did we do? What did we learn? Um, during the kickoff, you know, talking about those hurdles internally, all that pre-project work, I think helped jumpstart the project with FFW because we had already hashed out some of our, our odd or institution specific things so that we can move quicker with FFW. We didn't have to go, oh, wait a minute, we didn't think about that or we didn't think about that. Those did still come up, but at least during the pre-planning, we had found enough of them. Uh, so I'll keep you know, enough in quotes is that you're never fully ready. Uh, if you do, you're gonna be in the analysis paralysis trying to start, so we knew we had to get started. Um, Things I think that made uh, the kickoff go quicker was we documented our onboarding steps. So it made introducing new members uh, to the WDS team essentially uh, easier and quicker. Um, we broke the work into phases, which I think made the project less daunting. Uh, and like I said, you're not, you're not gonna know everything up front. So, uh, so we kicked off. Uh, communication was a huge part of this project. Um, and part of that was knowing what are the communication forums at Princeton? Which groups did we have to reach out to specifically? Which groups did we have to show up and do presentations to um, so that they bought into this project? So if you think about this project, we're, we're making people change. And like they don't, they're probably thinking, well, my website's fine. I don't want to change, you know. It's, don't make me do this work. So explaining this why to them was important. Um, keeping things secure, uh, maintainable, w was a big part of the communication. Also explaining to them like, what to expect from the upgrade was a key part of our communication plan. Here's what we expect of you. We're hoping to make the work like, light on your part. Um, we outline on a website, like, here's what to expect. Here's the steps. You know, we're gonna tell you when your upgrade's coming. We're gonna ask you to pause editing for a little bit. We're gonna have you look at this site and um, we're gonna have you report issues to us. And um, here's some new ways of editing things. So um, telling them what to expect helped. Um, I think I also, part of my thing was aiming to tell them like, don't worry, you, we hope to make this easy on you. Because they're busy and they, you know, they might not have necessarily had time to, to redo their site. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, yeah, so we did presentations, we sent emails out to groups, we had a website informing them about the project, FAQs, what to expect. We had email templates, because we would repeatedly send things out to different groups, so we wanted to be consistent with our messaging. Some of the challenges with communication, this was a long project, you saw in 2019, I probably started talking and socializing the idea of Princeton, that we are gonna upgrade soon. And now we're in 2023, and so for some audiences, the period between the initial communication and now, it's, it's pretty long. Sometimes I don't remember what someone told me last month, so trying to, to remind them, 
enough, but not too often, uh, is a challenge. Also, the tools to communicate efficiently uh, it was a challenge. So we, don't, we didn't have everybody on an email list of all these types. Um, we had spreadsheets with emails in them. So sometimes there's a challenge going from a spreadsheet to a mail merge to your email. That could be a challenge. Um, and then we knew when, when it came time to ask the site owners to test, sometimes getting their attention was tricky, um, or sometimes getting them to focus on just the things we needed them to test and not the other stuff was a challenge. But I think so far in the end, um, most people tested as much as we needed them to. And if not, um, Part of the scope of this was that in some cases we were just going to launch people and whether or not we had heard from them we were going to deal with it after we launched them so that's also part of the we got to get through this okay so project management um, so we did have a project manager uh, we, we do have a project manager just for this project i think it was um, a win that the, our project manager has drupal experience um, they're not just a meeting scheduler and task assigner. They're not afraid to talk tech. Um, they're not afraid to log into Drupal and, and help when they can. And so having a project manager that knows Drupal um, was, was, was beneficial. Um, tools that we use, we use Google Apps, Sheets, things like that. We use Slack, Jira. Um, we, have t we, we have and had um, two custom applications. Uh, so I mentioned the site's database, and that is that was sort of our record of like what site is owned by what with what URLs, um, and what was its provisioning date, uh, which has since been expanded to now have characteristics like last login, um, like last edit. So that's going forward will be our way to prune the dead sites. Um, does it have a site owner that's still active with an active net ID at the university? Uh, that is th that custom coded sites database. And then during the project, we made a custom coded, I'll call it like a throwaway application, uh, as a communication tool to our um, Open Scholar bundle of site owners. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. We knew we did not have them on an email list. So we sent them an email. In the email, there was a link that said, do you still need the site? Yes, no. They would click one. It would get recorded in our custom application. And we could go from there. Uh, challenges during this with project manager. We, our project manager did leave mid-project for good reasons. There was a great opportunity still within IT at Princeton that they took. So uh, our project manager is down the hall. Um, didn't go far. And that was that was, a, that was a win for him, but a little bit of a oh my god, what am I going to do for me? Um, and we so we did hire uh, someone uh, to fill in, which it's. Kind of, I describe it like you're switching pilots while flying the plane, um, and that worked out well. But a lesson learned from that is instead of having your project manager be the contact for your project, we set up a project email. So if people switch out, you don't have to start explaining, well, stop emailing him and start emailing her. You know what I mean? So we have a project email. The other benefit of that project email is that we could all log into the emails about the project and see what was going on. So project email, I think it's called drupalupgrade.princeton.edu. Fun, so if you have a multi-year project, uh, how do you keep the momentum going when you like just want it to be over, you're sick of it, I'm sick of it, I'm ready to be done with Drupal 7? Well, we, we folded paper tigers. We were trying to make a paper tiger to represent every Drupal 7 site that we no longer had. So we did um, paper tigers, we're a little bit behind on that. Um, and we celebrated the milestone, so we we go out to eat when we shut down um, one of those types of sites. So it's some fun. Le some lessons learned. Okay, the, the dead websites that, that surprised me. I mean, I knew we had some. I didn't know how many we actually had. So um, dead websites. I uh, I probably would have. And if I'm not doing this again, huh? Um, <laughs> if I had to start a, another Drupal 7 upgrade, I would have put a lot more time and energy into like getting rid of the dead stuff up front. That just would have cleared the plate and had us focused 
on what we really needed to upgrade. Um, and because it did, it impacted the scope. Yeah, you know, I think it, the it was a moving target sometimes of like, well, we think we have 360. No, no, it's 350 today. No, 355. So um, dead websites. The, the pre-planning work, um, in retrospect, it, it did, I think it paid off because we did dive into the sites and find more oddities early on than um, too late. We, we do still find them, but we found enough. Um, breaking the project into phases, right? Not just so you can have like a party for each phase, but also just makes it manageable for estimation and getting the project done and, and celebrating the end of a phase. Uh, I mentioned the project email, so having one project email, not just a project manager email, a personal email. Um, we also, during the project, I think we worried about things that the site owners did not worry about. We were more worried about them than they were, and um, that's a good thing, I, I think, but um, maybe some needless worry that we thought, oh my god, everyone's going to complain about this, whatever this is, and they ended up not complaining about it, so that was good. Um, I think for me also, you have to roll with and manage the unknown. You're going to go in with enough information and you're going to go down a path and you have to start going down the path and you'll discover more and more as you go on. So roll with and manage the unknown. Um, it's also hard to keep the momentum going on a long project, so um, having fun is important. And then last, I think even if at the end of the project, even though you're exhausted, I think it's key to do cleanup steps. Um, it, I think it's also an information security concern. Clean up files, clean up code, really close, close doors, empty the trash. Th that, that's key. So um, just remember to clean up even if you're exhausted from a, from a project. Um, that's it. I'm just, uh, so I'm curious in, in the room, how many people are planning a Drupal upgrade? Okay. And how many people are like in, in the middle of a Drupal upgrade or you're doing it? Okay, okay. good to know. Um, so um, that's me, Jill Maraca. You're welcome to email me any questions or I think we've got five, six minutes for questions. Yep. Did you migrate directly from uh, seven to nine or did you have to go through intermediate steps? Yep, good question. So did we migrate directly from seven to nine? No, we did not. So we went from seven to eight, and then during the project, at a certain point where we thought we were ready, we went from eight to nine. So then we started migrating from seven to nine during the project. How did you deal with the COVID outbreak since you started the project right at the, yeah. you know, the cusp of COVID, yep. the exception of COVID? Yeah, so good question. How did we, we deal with the COVID outbreak? Yeah, so... Um, at Princeton in, in March of 2020? 2020. 2020. Yeah. March 13th. March 13th, yeah, about three years. We were, we were told we were working from home, so we all went and worked from home and got on Zoom. We all learned Zoom really quickly. Um, but we, we kept going. Um, there wasn't too much of a slowdown. There was a couple of things early in 2020 where we were asked to work on some COVID-specific projects. Um, but uh, it, it didn't disrupt our, our movement toward Drupal, Drupal 8, Drupal 9. Um, yeah, if anything, you know, we, we just learned to work remotely quicker. Um, and that, that did benefit us because our, our FFW partners were uh, around the world. And so it was at that point when we were rolling with things, it was the norm for us to get on Zoom and, and get our meetings done. Yep. What did you learn about managing technical debt? Like, are you doing a better job with the mistakes you're making today as you learn new things? Good question. So, what did I learn about managing technical debt? I what I learned was that sometimes there is like good necessary technical debt, and then there is there is um, and so I'll just say the good necessary technical debt is it's just debt you you had to have because you were learning, and the, the only way to learn is that you're going to make mistakes. Um, and nothing is perfect from the, from the get-go. So the, when we did the Drupal 7 platform, um, we, we had technical debt, for sure. And we knew, and that all informed making the next 
iteration of it better because we knew we're like, okay, we're not going to have that technical debt or that or that or that. And so all of that debt informed the new product. Um, bad, bad technical debt happens too. It's just if you're doing something like quick and sloppy, lazy, you know, you say, well, I got to just do this to get it done and you never go back and do it the right way. Um, that would be the bad technical debt. But more so, I, I look at some technical debt with, with a positive spin. Yeah, talking about uh, technical debt, uh, can you list what were the <coughs> most difficult technical challenges apart from the managerial things that uh, the manager left? In the That's like a whole presentation. Okay. <laughs> the, the, so the question is, what, what were some of, some of the technical debt th that we had to deal with? Um, I'd probably say the CSS injector technical debt um, was a was a big challenge. So for any time, so it's, I don't know if you're familiar with CSS injector in the room. Um, yeah, okay. Some of us, you know, I, I was doing a presentation online during COVID and there was a chat going on and I mentioned CSS injector and someone in the chat wrote, you know, what is that? And someone immediately responded like, you do not want to ever do this. <laughs> um, it basically allows you to override the theme in a CSS file on your project. It, it can be useful when used in a minimum way. But what we, we found is that for these sites, we had like hundreds of lines of CSS injector when we really just should have made a custom theme. However, making a custom theme for, for, a, for our platform, which had so many options and things you could turn on and place and everything, it actually would have been too much work to do when really we just needed a way to change some color backgrounds and things. So, so that CSS injector technical debt informed the new platform in that we made sure we built in with certain blocks in the layout builder that people could, in just a point and click way, pick some different backgrounds that we had preset without having to write CSS injector code. So that was one of the big ones. What about the, uh, the PHP version uh, from five to seven and seven? I don't know. Yeah. So the other question was the PHP version of five to seven to five. Um, I don't think that was a big problem. All the developers might disagree, but I, I don't remember that being a big problem. I'll leave the um, CSS injector and the, um, we did a lot. The other technical debt. We did a lot of like slideshows of content and things, and they weren't the most usable, accessible thing. And people just got in the habit of liking them, and we're like, oh, we wish you would stop doing that. It's not the best way to present content. Yep. When you were going from eight to nine, did you already have like an uh, automated updater in place, or did you find yourself having to like update a lot of modules manually before you could upgrade core? That is probably a good question for the next oh, okay. presentation right after this. Yeah. Um, in the front, yeah. Can you tell me uh, roughly the responsibilities between the vendor partner and the Princeton team? Yeah, okay, so question, the responsibilities between the uh, Princeton and our vendor partner, who, who's re responsible for what? So um, we were responsible, without telling like the whole entire laundry list of things, we were responsible for letting our vendor know when um, we needed something enhanced in our platform. And then we, we were responsible for doing the enhancement. So let's say there was a new content type that we needed. We wanted to build that because we knew we had to maintain it ongoing. Um, but our vendor was responsible for writing the upgrade scripts, so going from seven to nine. Um, but we, we uh, and it was definitely a partnership. There was definitely a lot of conversation. Um, but we knew that there were certain things that we wanted to write because um, we just, we, we just, we knew we had to maintain it long term. It was probably quicker for us to write because we knew the platform anyway. So just, it's a really short way of saying there's a lot, there's a lot more to it, but those are the main things. Okay. Yep. So you could evaluate the buy-in we got from faculty, staff, and administrative department. So we, we also just finished, we did seven to nine, you know, we just launched uh, about the end of last year. And one of our, our really sticking points was that administrative departments and faculty just seem to yeah. So are the questions buy in and that faculty staff students yeah. they just didn't care. Okay. Um, just, or, or just non plus buy. It's like okay, you're doing an upgrade. Like we would solicit feedback like you haven't updated your site in like six months or eight months. Do you yeah. still need it? Yeah, are you gonna update it? No. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, kind of stuff. Yeah, so our, yeah, our approach was actually like we were doing the upgrade for them. They didn't have a choice. They had to upgrade. 
Um, so the, their buy-in was like, you, you have no choice but to upgrade. Um, if they didn't want to, then their, their site would be shut down. Um, our, 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 the way we sold though, the upgrade to get ex people excited about it is that there were now new things that we built in, new features, easier ways to do things. And for, if you remember that type of custom sites we had, those people had no control over their layout. They couldn't put blocks in. It was just like a fixed static thing. We now got people excited that they could build their layouts without knowing the Drupal code. So that excited people. And um, I think we got people excited through our the emails that we send and through our training classes, learning the new features. So the feedback has been positive in the new platform. Yeah, I think after we launched, people were happy that they could like, move stuff around, change blocks around, kind of change the layout of their page without having to you know, use like, the arduous D7 like, you know, template, you know, just type in a box kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, we're going to be going from line 10, like most people are, soon, and we're trying to get a little bit more yeah. A little more enthusiastic. Yeah. yeah. And getting more enthusiastic can be tough because they, they just, yeah. up front they might not be enthused, but then once they see what they get, I think the enthusiasm builds. We also refreshed our theme at, during the time too, so just, they, they were getting a better looking website. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, John. Uh, having been one of the companies who've been on this thing, we spend a lot of time thinking about it, so I have one of the, these two questions for after the fact. Uh, first of all, I was very worried about all those custom sites and the, and the code within them. In the end, how much percentage of the work was it to figure out how to move those sites from Drupal 7? Um, okay, so the question is, so the custom sites, what was the percentage of work to figure out how to get them from 7 to 10? I'm not sure percentage-wise. I, I can tell you, though, that for each one of those custom sites, um, our design managers and team, we they, they met for, like, sometimes several hours per site to go through and figure things out and actually draft up notes like, this is like this now, this is how we want it. So it, it was probably several hours per site. Um, because we're not done with that phase yet, I'm not sure what it, the hours ends up being, but it, 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 was a, it was a little easier than I thought. Huh. Yeah. Because that's the part that scared me the most, so. That was definitely the most scary part, yeah, okay. yeah. And so thank you. The second question was, for stuff like you already mentioned, that CSS injector or stuff that doesn't migrate cleanly, like, like panels to paragraphs or, or something similar, uh, how much of a burden did you put, in, in a good way, not, not you, yeah. the that's that way, how much of a burden did you manage to put on the content creators of each individual site? Like, hey, you wrote custom CSS to modify the old system, we have a new theme, well, go and re modify it yourself. Did yeah. You do that? Good, yeah, so good question. So how much of a burden did we put on the site owners to, to do, um, like recreating panels or recreating something that had to be recreated? We tried to put minimum burden on. Um, we had um, a QA resource from FSW dedicated to going through cleaning up, things that we could not automate in the migration and had to be manual. We dedicated hours to doing that. Um, and I can say, um, some folks on my team, especially Jess Monaco, she's, she spent hours of her own time just kind of manually recreating things. That it just, the, the time to automate versus manually doing it, it just, you know, it was easier just manually do it. So we tried to put minimum amount of work on the site creators. So most, for the most part, is, is on your team or FFW? Yep, well, yeah, most of ours, us or FFW. So In the back? Related to that question, uh, your, your content migration was automated or it was like, uh, Oh, yeah. So, question is: Our content uh, was it uh, migration? Was it automated or manual? It was uh, mostly automated. Mostly automated. Yeah. Any tools that you use? I don't know. Migrate uh, API. Migrate API. There we go. <laughs> Migrate API was probably in there. Um, not sure. Yeah. There might have been a number of tools. You, you I could. Guess, you I guess from eight to nine would be more automatic and then compared to seven. Yeah, so mid-project, we did go from 8 to 9, that was automatic, but from 7 to 8, um, there was custom migration scripts written by FFW. I'm not sure what other tools they used. Yeah. You mentioned thousands of sites. Are they all uh, uh, hosted on each individual server, or it's a single site, a multi-site server? Yeah, good question. So are th are th thousands of sites, are they on each server or not? So they are hosted in Aquia's site factory. Um, so Site Factory allows us to have a single stack and they're all hosted together in a single stack, um, which I believe is they build theirs on AWS. Um, we actually chose to split our sites into two stacks 
to make uh, just think deployment a little safer and quicker. Um, but they are all in a, in a multi-site, yeah. Okay, I think we're over time, but there's all good questions. So uh, thank you for coming. Thanks, I appreciate it.